So I'm going to talk about this wonderful lady shown on the screen here, who I hope is familiar to all of you, and use her to ask some questions about life, not only on the red planet, but in the universe. So I want to start out by asking you a question. Are we alone? No. Are we alone in this room? Are we alone in this state? On this continent? On this planet? In the universe. There is probably no more fundamental question that defines human existence than this one. People have been thinking about it truly since the dawn of human consciousness. A big turning point in this sort of discussion came in 1543, when Copernicus published a book saying the unusual idea that the universe did not revolve around the Earth, but instead revolved around the Sun, and that we here on Earth were just riding along on a planet in a solar system. From this conclusion, it was soon realized that all the stars we see in the sky are simply potential places for other solar systems and other planet Earths. And this turned out to be a point at which the idea of thinking about life on other places became not just speculation, but actually a likelihood. So in order to talk about life in other places, we need to have a definition for what life really is. We look around us and we think we all know what life is. Biologists have textbook definitions, which of course I never learned because I never took biology. <laughs> but they talk about things like metabolism, the ability to reproduce, respond to stimuli, have natural evolution. But a theologian or a philosopher might define life differently. As a planetary scientist, I think about the definition of life as being something that's based on DNA and that evolved in water. And that's the key to tying this discussion today to our nice rover curiosity, which is looking for life by looking for signs of water. Now on Earth, we all think we know what life is, but it turns out that detecting life from a robot or a spacecraft is not so straightforward. And the great man Carl Sagan in 1980 devised a really interesting experiment. We had at that time a rover, or sorry, a, an orbiter called Galileo, which was a probe on its way to study the, the satellites and the outer solar system, in particular Jupiter. But Carl Sagan noticed that the Galileo um, spacecraft was going to pass by Earth, and he designed a set of experiments to see if we could detect life on Earth from a spacecraft. <laughs> How do you do that? Only Carl Sagan would come up with an idea like this, right? <laughs> It turned out that it was successful. So how do you think he saw he did this? Uh, my students always say, oh, he saw the Great Wall of China. Well, you, it's very difficult to actually to see human structures from spacecraft. Instead, we saw some things that you might not think about. The first is green. You know, green is the color of chlorophyll, which is the characteristic of photosynthesis. That's a sign of life on Earth. The other one you see here, blue, the blue of the oceans. Of course, Earth is the only planet in our solar system right now that has water in all three phases, liquid, gas, and solid. We also detected with the Galileo spacecraft r radar signals of television broadcasts, radio broadcasts, and radar. And all of those signals, of course, got stronger as you got closer to Earth, indicating that they were coming from Earth. So if we ever heard those coming from another planet, and if you've ever seen Scooby-Doo and the alien invaders, you know this might happen. Um, that was another sign that they de detected. And finally, a fourth thing detected by the Galileo spacecraft, about which I'll speak later, was methane in our atmosphere. Methane happens to be a, a chemical which is produced by, for example, cows, <laughs> many different kinds of biological organisms, and it's present in our atmosphere in very large quantities. And what's unusual about that is that it coexists with free oxygen, with molecular oxygen. And those two chemicals don't like to coexist together, and they can only be found together in the atmosphere of a planet if they're being constantly replenished. So the fact that we see lots of methane in the Earth's atmosphere means that there's lots of things on Earth that are producing it. So remember that for later. <laughs> so we turn now to Mars. What about the search for life on Mars? Many of the students that I teach today don't realize that we actually went to these planets fairly recently. The first landers on the surface of Venus and Mars were in the 1960s. Before that, it was actually thought that there were different kinds of civilizations living on these planets. They thought that there was an uh, entire uh, civilization of swamp dwellers on Venus. <laughs> and the idea was that Venus is closer to the sun and therefore was hotter, and Venus is shrouded by clouds. So they thought that there was this, you know, uh, civilization of people with, with webbed feet <laughs> who could live in these swampy, warm conditions. 
Similarly, in the 19th century, a Boston Brahmin named Percival Lowell popularized the idea that the surface of Mars was populated by a series of people who built canals running from the poles to the equator. And he postulated, based on um, telescopic observations that showed these lines, which turned out to be just simply aberrations, but he postulated that this civilization was building these canals as a sort of a last gasp effort to get water from the poles down to the equator where they were living. So again, we have this, this issue of water arising in, in, in terms of perpetuating life in other places. And water is the thing, of course, that we are now looking for with the rover Curiosity. So here's our girl. Um, this is the rover. I've seen its uh, twin um, at, at the Jet Propulsion Lab in California. Of course, it's bristling with, with equipment. And Curiosity's uh, goal is really to look for signs of life on Mars today and in Mars's past, and also to consider the possibility of human habitability of Mars in the future. So you see that, that there are many different ways of thinking about this question of what is life, what was life, and what will life one day be when we live on Mars. So to answer that question, I have to give you a little bit of history. So this is a, time, a timeline of Mars. Um, Mars was formed about 4.6 4 billion years ago, the same time as Earth. And in the early times on Mars, uh, the first, say, half a, million, half a billion years um, uh, on Mars, there was standing water everywhere, just as there was on Earth. And over time, a couple of sad things happened to Mars. Mars is a much smaller planet than Earth, and because of that, its core cooled off more quickly, and it's lost its magnetic field. Now, you may realize that a magnetic field is what protects us here on Earth from the solar wind, and it also allows our atmosphere to stay attached to the Earth. But on Mars, as soon as the magnetic field died, the, the solar wind was able to blow the atmosphere away, leaving Mars a cool and dry planet today. So that happened fairly early on in Mars's history, probably more than, well more than three billion years ago. And yet, there was a period of time, several hundred million years, during which the conditions on Mars were very much like the conditions on Earth. Warm water, standing water in a lot of places, and certainly all the things were there, all the uh, chemical elements were there, ready for life to have formed. And of course, the question is, did it? There are some people who think abs the answer to that question is absolutely yes. And they base their answers on a study of this unusual meteorite. Oops. It was found in Antarctica in 1984. And a group of scientists from uh, Johnson Space Center found many microbes in this meteorite that suggested that there are uh, unusual uh, life forms on Mars, unusual in the sense that they are smaller than those that we see on Earth, that left their signatures in this meteorite, which was then transported conveniently by an impact from Mars to Earth. We call that the, the poor man's space program. <laughs> uh, and although these conclusions remain controversial, the good part of the discovery of this um, signatures of life in this meteorite, or potential ones, was that it spurred a whole line of investigations um, of the surface of Mars by the United States Space Program. And that gets us back to curiosity, about which I'm happy to talk because I've been living and breathing um, curiosity for the last uh, several months, and certainly actually for seven years. So here's where we are. We landed, as some of you know, in August um, in a place called Gar Gale Crater on the surface of Mars. It's a 150-kilometer uh, crater, and it's very unusual. At some point in Mars's history, this thing filled up with sediments. And then later, water and erosion eroded away, leaving this mountaintop, which is completely layered. So has a very, we landed in the low, flat part, and our goal in the next two Martian years is to climb this mountain and read the geology of Mars. Um, sedimentary deposits like this are stratified in history. So the ones at the bottom are the oldest ones, and the ones at the top are, are youngest. So by driving up, we're really, you know, reading a, reading a book about the history of Mars and hopefully looking for water. And of course, we're looking for signs of water in things like minerals in the rocks that are at the bottom because those are the oldest and the ones that might, are, are the most likely to be uh, containing what we're looking for. So here's an image of um, this mountain, which has been designated Mount Sharp in honor of a famous planetary uh, scientist. And the rover, if you were to see the rover up on this mountain, it would be a tiny speck. Uh, but this is an incredibly high resolution image, higher than any resolution on a camera that you might have, that was taken recently um, of, of Mount Sharp. And the scientists have already, mostly the engineers, have carefully crafted a route up this mountain to make sure that we don't get stuck. <laughs> 
So yeah, there's an, there's an example. You can hardly see that boulder, but that's the size of Curiosity. How, how big is Curiosity? When I stand next to it, it's, it's about my height. Um, apparently it weighs about the same as uh, a Mini Cooper. So if any of you drive that, you'll, you, have, you can just tell yourself you're driving a replica of the rover. Um, okay, what exciting data have we brought back from the rover so far? What I'm showing you here are two different locations, um, one called Link on the lower left and another one called Goldburn Scour on the upper right, um, of rocks that should look very familiar to those of us from the Pioneer Valley. There are deposits that are identical to this in, in Turner's Falls, on Mount Sugarloaf. And what you're seeing here, and notice the scale bars here, these are amazingly beautiful high definition images. What you're seeing are pebbles in various shapes. The pebbles are rounded. There's an assortment of sizes present. And you can see that they're kind of in layers. These are stream bed deposits. Uh, now, admittedly, they're probably three billion plus year old stream bed deposits, but they look just like the ones in the Pioneer Valley that are 300 million years old. To a geologist, it's kind of all the same. <laughs> um, what can we learn from this? I'm, think, I'm sure you're thinking, well, that looks like the gravel in my parking lot <laughs> uh, or, the, or the break in, the, in my sidewalk that was opened up by the flood last week. But in fact, we can tell lots of interesting things from these images, not the least of which is, for example, that the water that made this stream was probably flowing at about three feet per second. So, you know, close your eyes for a second and imagine a leaf drifting along on top of a stream that's floating at three feet per second. That's really interesting. What does that tell us? It tells us that there were standing bodies of water on Mars that were feeding this stream. And all of these then become potential habitats for life to have formed. Now, there aren't signs for life everywhere on Mars. These are two shots of Mars sand, and I, I, I love to show the difference between if you were standing on Mars, looking at something in Mars light versus under Earth light. Um, because on Mars, of course, there's no atmosphere. The only thing that refracts in the sky are the little particles of dust. So the sky on Mars is actually kind of orange. Um, so in Mars light, this sand dune would look as you see it on the left. In Earth lighting, it looks as you see it on the right. And these grains of sand were just recently analyzed by something called ChemMin, which is another one of the instruments on the Curiosity rover. And what we found out was that the minerals in this sand look very much like the minerals in any kind of basaltic deposit. So it's olivines, feldspar, pyroxenes, mineral names that may not mean anything to you, but you've seen them in basaltic rocks all over the world. So these are minerals that are not really very stable in the presence of water. So this sand, which has been blowing around on the surface of Mars for billions of years, represents a dry phase. So we're looking at the Curiosity landing site at two different things. We're looking at rocks, the bedrock, and the rocks that we're going to see in the layer cake of Mount Sharp, which represent, uh, hopefully, a geological history dating from the wet period into the dry period. And then the dust that we see on the surface of Mars is just a, a combination of loose particles, mostly from the top layers, which represent a dry period. So really a, a history of water on Mars that bears in the, into the history of life. The next picture I have to show you is uh, and something that was done by the instrument I've worked the most on, which is the ChemCam. It's a chemistry camera uh, in instrument. And this is particularly uh, Star Wars-y in my mind. Uh, the ChemCam instrument shoots a laser at a rock from 24 feet away and burns a, a hole in a rock that's about the size of a grain of salt. So it would be like me, you know, well, it, it, hitting the other side of this podium, of this uh, stage would be easy for ChemCam. And it then heats that little grain to 2,000 degrees and makes it into a plasma and essentially burns its way into the rock, determining what the rock's chemical composition is. And so here's a nice picture on the right here of what it looks like after we've uh, lasered a rock. You can see there are, we did a nice little pattern of five, um, five shots. I'm sure eventually we'll be able to figure out how to like, put our initials in rocks on Mars. But <laughs> we're not allowed to do that yet. But, but the thing I want to point out about these incredible images, you can see that's three inches across. So if there were microfossils in this rock, we would see them. And so we're going to be looking for evidence of microfossils as we, as we go up M Mount Sharp and make our way f forward on Mars. And I just have to put in this in because this is what I work on. These are the spectra that we're using to make those kinds of conclusions. We're using chem cam to study the chemistry of rocks on Mars. And of course, one of the things we're looking for is hydrogen. Finally, I wanted to show this slide. Yesterday, there was a press conference at the Jet Propulsion Lab to talk about the first results from something called a mass spectrometer on the Curiosity rover. And in the press conference, they talked about measurements they've been making to try to look at methane in the Martian atmosphere. And I've already explained to you why. If there's methane, it means that something might be producing it. 
And to date, we did not yet find any evidence, but they're going to keep looking. Um, methane distribution, it turns out, can be um, extremely variable by seasons. And of course, if we do find it, then we have to, we have, to make, have an argument about whether the methane is coming from non-biological sources or biological sources. So stay tuned. There's going to be a lot more really interesting information about methane coming from the Curiosity rover soon. And finally, I wanted to close by saying that even if Curiosity doesn't find evidence of life having been on Mars or being on Mars right now, that doesn't say that there isn't a future for life on Mars for humans. There is, of course, this biological concept called biological imperative, which says that every species will continue to seek out places for its, its own survival. And if you think about this from a, a broad perspective of global change and human, the potential for human dis destruction or even impacts of giant meteorites destroying the Earth, it's not so ridiculous to think that, that human beings will eventually establish um, places to live on Mars. And these are, um, as you can see, images from NASA. So this is something NASA is thinking a lot about. And I'm happy to stand here today and say that I think very surely that my grandchildren will live to see humans um, living on Mars for extended periods of time. So on that, I will end by saying that we're just, we've just broken the tip of the iceberg on this Curiosity mission. We are, um, on Tuesday, going to be on Sol, which is Martian Day, the, our term for Martian Day, Sol 90. Um, but we expect to be on Mars for a full year, which is um, more than 600 days. So there's a lot more really interesting data to come from the Curiosity rover. We're not even at the base of the mountain yet. We're still driving across the bottom of the crater uh, to, to reach the mace. The, the base. And I think that um, as we continue to work on the data from this rover in my lab at Mar Mount Holyoke, shown here, I think our curiosity knows no bounds, and I hope that the public's curiosity stays excited about this rover because it's going to be a wild ride. Thank you very much. Thank you.